Hello, 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 everybody. Hello, ladies. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, uh, fish. I don't know. Get on with it. All right. So this episode is sponsored by italki. If you're looking for a one-to-one teacher, then look no further because you can find loads of them on italki. Are you looking for a one-to-one teacher? You might be going, I really need to find a one-to-one teacher to work on my English. But where could I find one? I'll help you. Use italki. Because you can find loads of teachers on italki. You can arrange lessons then on Skype, wherever you are, whenever you want. It's not just Skype. Other software platforms are available. That's the purpose of italki, to help you find the right teacher for you and for your English needs. And it's now a very well-established company, largely thanks to um, these promos that I do at the beginning of my episodes. I think that's the main reason that italki is now so well-established. He said, ironically... Um, It's now a very well-established company that makes it easier than ever to get convenient and professional English lessons or conversations into your life. There's a very sophisticated search function to help you find just the right person for you. And also, italki will send you a voucher for a free lesson when you use my link to get some talking time. Does that make sense? Just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk to get started or click an italki logo on my website. I'm happy to tell you about italki at the beginning of episodes sometimes because I think it's a good uh, combination. Getting lessons and conversations on italki, listening to the podcast, I think that's a good combination for success with English. All right, teacherluke.co.uk slash talk to get started. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. How are you today? Hope you're well. It's absolutely boiling here, boiling hot. We're in the middle of a heat wave, and today the temperature is expected to be in the high 30s with a feels-like temperature somewhere in the 40s. That's what my weather app is telling me on my phone. High 30s with a feels-like temperature somewhere in the 40s. Now, I've never really understood that. Do you get that in in your weather reporting? The feels-like temperature. So there's the real temperature and then the temperature that it feels like, the feels-like temperature. I've never really understood that. So the temperature is 39, but it feels like 43. So isn't the temperature just 43 then? I don't really get it. In any case, it is boiling. So if at some point I stop talking, you hear a thud, like a thuff sound, and the podcast just goes silent, don't worry, I've just passed out from heat stroke or exhaustion or something. Just joking, of course. I don't think I'm going to pass out. I think I'm going to be all right, but it is very, very hot. These aren't exactly perfect conditions for podcasting, but my dauntless British spirit is unbowed by any crisis, as we heard in the last episode. So I will be just fine. Thank you. I wonder how it is where you are. Maybe you're also being affected by this heat heat wave, which I think is spreading across parts of Europe. <clears throat> Maybe it's just totally normal um, for you at this time of year, to be completely boiling and totally uncomfortable and unable to breathe. Maybe you love that. I don't know. Anyway, enough idle chit-chat. Let's get on to this episode. And uh, this is episode 602, and it's the second part of this episode I'm doing about British comedy, uh, this British comedy TV show called The Day to Day. You should listen to part one before listening to this, and also know that there are notes, videos, and bits of transcription on the page for this episode on my website. Just go to teacherluke.co.uk and check the episode archive, where you'll find all the other episode pages, including some bonus website-only content too. In the first part of this episode, I talked to you about the day-to-day, what kind of program it is, who made it, and so on. Then we listened to three clips from that show, which you can find on YouTube, and then I broke them down for language and to help you understand the humour. And that's exactly what we're going to continue doing in this episode. I have three more clips available on YouTube, so let's do it like this. First, I'll talk to you about the clip that we're going to see, explaining the context, giving you the main details, and asking you to listen out for certain things. This part is necessary because it will really help you understand the reference points and bits of humour that you might otherwise miss. 
Then we'll listen again bit by bit and I'll explain specific things, including phrases or other features of English. Hopefully, through this process, you will understand and appreciate the humour and you'll also pick up some English in the process. Just a reminder, just uh, a little reminder, the day-to-day is a parody news programme, of course. None of the stories we're going to hear about is real. Uh, It's all completely made up uh, parody for comedy purposes. None of the stories is real. That's the correct grammar, isn't it? None of the... Hold on a minute. Okay. I knew that some of you would be thinking, wait a minute, none of the stories is real. Now, the thing is that with none, none actually can uh, take either a singular or plural verb. So there you go. No, Nothing to worry about. Um, none. What does none mean? Sometimes it means not one, in which case it would be um, singular, right? So um, let me just go back to what I said. So um, not one. That's it. None of the stories we're going to hear is real. You could say not one of the stories is real, meaning none of them, right? But also sometimes none means not any. So not any of the stories we're going to hear about are real. So it could be either none is or none are. Anyway, in any case, none of the stories we're going to hear about is real, are real. It's all completely made up parody for comedy purposes. This show makes fun of the conventions and cliches of TV news and current affairs programs. And it does it uh, with a weird and surreal twist. Also... I would like to appeal to you to write to me about these episodes, uh, either in the comments section or just by email. Whenever I do episodes about comedy, I wonder what people are thinking. Part one of this is doing well in terms of numbers of listens and downloads, but in terms of comments, there are only a couple on the website, and I've received maybe one email about this. So I would like to appeal to you to get into the comments section. As a teacher in a classroom and as a stand-up comedian in a comedy club, um, I get instant feedback on what I'm saying and doing, just from the the reactions of the people there. On the podcast, it's not like that. I record episodes, publish them, and then I have no idea beyond just a few numbers what people think. So write to me and let me know what you think of this. Do you understand it all? Does it entertain you or disturb you? What are you thinking? Let me know in the comments section or maybe by sending me a private message. Okay then, so let's carry on with the first of our three clips. This clip uh, from the day-to-day is actually from episode one and I've called it uh, Chopper of Doom or otherwise known as It's Your Blood, Chopper of Doom. Now, this is from a feature on the program which which is called It's Your Blood. Uh, which is a dramatic sounding title. And It's Your Blood is exactly like those old TV shows that told stories of bad accidents and how the emergency services responded to them. We used to have a show called 999 on the BBC, which was exactly the same as this. They always used reconstructions with actors to remake the accident. And they were very cheaply done with all the victims telling the story with a voiceover. The presenter was Michael Burke again. Do you remember Michael Burke? He's the, he was the newsreader that we heard on the BBC Nine O'Clock News at the beginning of part one of this. So the presenter of 999 was Michael Burke again. And he had a certain kind of tone, which was serious and stern with a slightly patronising edge. As if to say, if you're stupid enough not to take precautions, then you deserve to have an accident. It's kind of what it feels like. He doesn't actually say that. Perhaps with a little pause, looking at the camera and saying, try not to be an idiot. You know, something like that. Let's listen to an actual snippet of 999. This is the real show. Uh, We're going to listen to a little bit of BBC's 999. I'd like you to listen out for the stern, dramatic and slightly patronising tone of it. Also, it's presenting itself as a public safety broadcast, but really it's just stories of bad accidents reconstructed for our entertainment. But they are sort of obliged to add this kind of stern, you know, um, I, you know, if, if, for example... If you went on holiday and one of your family had a terrible accident, would you know what to do? You know, it's that kind of thing. So, let's listen to this little clip from BBC 999. Okay, so here we go. And listen out for the tense 
music, the dramatic music, like something out of a Hitchcock film with the sound of a ticking clock in the background as well. This is only going to be a couple of seconds, but it just gives you an idea of what the original 999 uh, television program was like. If one of your family injured themselves really badly in the garden or anywhere else for that matter, would you know what to do? If not, or if it's a while since you've done any basic first aid training, then why not apply for a place on one of our 999 Lifesaver roadshows? One day it could save the life of someone you love. Okay, that's just a little clip there. He's talking about the 999 Lifesaver roadshows, which are, you know, to be fair, a very good idea. They send a group of trainers around the country training people on basic first aid so that they know how to look after loved ones if they have accidents but still that kind of mix of public uh, information in terms of here's how you make you know your garden safe or something with this kind of tone of if if a member of your family had an actual bad accident would you know what to do uh, with the drama, the dramatic music in the background. So let's get on to the day-to-day parody version of this, which uh, was called It's Your Blood. Um, the line from the introduction from the show is this. Um, Every week on It's Your Blood, we feature an actual bad accident. So this is a parody of that kind of show. Did you have shows like this in your countries? Someone tells the true story of a bad accident that they had, and then it's reconstructed using actors. And sometimes the real ambulance workers themselves are used as actors, and they're always terrible. In this clip that we're going to listen to, uh, the accident is that a farmer flies his helicopter above some fields, but while he's flying, he passes out. Okay? He loses consciousness, like me, maybe, if it gets too hot. So the farmer's flying his helicopter, he passes out, and the helicopter is then dangerously out of control in the sky, and it might crash on some children. Ah, horrible. Luckily, the farmer's dog is in the helicopter, so the authorities manage to save the situation with the help of a local shepherd. A shepherd is someone who uh, keeps sheep, you know, sheep, he keeps sheep and moves the sheep from one field to another, using a sheepdog and shepherds will communicate with the sheepdog with certain whistles <whistles> come by <whistles> like that they communicate with the dog and the dog runs around and sort of uh, shepherds the uh, the sheep into the right field or whatever so um luckily the because the farmer's dog is in the helicopter the authorities use a shepherd who whistles to the dog through the cb radio so they get the cb and the shepherd's going <whistles> helping the dog uh, to basically land the plane, which he does, okay? Now, if you're not listening carefully, you could easily miss the fact that the dog is the one that actually lands the plane because everything is told in such a serious way. The dog even has a voiceover at one point as he explains what it was like to fly in the helicopter. So if you're not kind of prepared, uh, watching the day-to-day can feel like you're watching a real programme because everything is done so realistically and so close to how it's actually done. It's just that the stories are completely ridiculous. So we're going to listen in a second. Here are some things I'd like you to listen out for. So listen out for how Chris Morris ramps up the drama by suggesting that the blades of a helicopter could easily kill humans. He says, Helicopters, machines for cutting air, air that's soft and easy to slice, like human beings. Uh, Listen out for the perhaps unnecessary levels of drama, violence and suspense in the retelling of the story. Listen out for um, the fact that making this reconstruction had ethical questions because it forced the victims to face their ordeal again. So um, this is just something he says in the introduction. Uh, Yeah, there there were sort of ethical considerations here because making the show forced the victims to face their ordeal again which arguably is kind of like a criticism of something like 999 where you're asking people to um retell the story and also even in some cases act out the 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 accident um for the cameras uh which potentially is something that could traumatize people again if it's been a particularly difficult um situation um 
he, he also says in the introduction, all bodily fluids are the ones that actually emerged at the time. All bodily fluids are the ones that actually emerged at the time. So uh, if we see any bodily fluids, which would include, I don't know, what blood, tears, vomit, and other things, all bodily fluids are the ones that actually emerged at the time. So what they're suggesting is that if you see any like bodily fluids in the reconstruction, these are the original fluids that they've somehow managed to get from the original accident. Now, that's ridiculous, obviously, and impossible. But somehow, this is exactly the kind of thing that they would say on a show like this. For example, the first 20 seconds of the real BBC 999 show. So I'm going to play you another little clip from 999. This is going to be the first 20 seconds of an episode. And just listen out for, I mean, something that's kind of close to, you know, that. Uh, Like, uh, all bodily fluids shown are the ones that actually emerged at the time. That's the sort of thing we're looking out for here. So this is the real first 20 seconds of an episode of BBC's 999. This one from 1998. All of tonight's rescues are true stories. We've sometimes used actors and stuntmen, but everything you see is based on the accounts of the people involved. They've helped us to reconstruct the events as they happened. Okay, so that's just a little taste of the opening titles of, again, the real 999 as we lead into listening to this clip. Chris Morris also says, For this reason and many others, you may find that the following sequence produces a very powerful sensation in your brain and body. Which is an extraordinary line. Listen out for how he says the final line. A very powerful sensation in your brain and body. In a kind of, he says it in a kind of tragic way because it involved an actual bad accident. So, I mean, they could just not show this, but for some reason it's their duty to show it and for us to watch it because a man had an accident and we shouldn't do it too. And for this reason and many others, you may find that the following sequence produces a very powerful sensation in your brain and body. Listen out for the voiceover from the sheepdog, Lindsay. So the sheepdog actually has a a voiceover. He says, it was smooth and exhilarating like an aerial motorbike, describing what it felt like to be in a a helicopter. That's actually the sheepdog speaking in voiceover. Watch out for that. Quick question for you. What actually causes the farmer to pass out? Um, It's not heat. It's not because it's so hot. There's something else that causes the farmer to pass out. What is it? Also, uh, listen out for the fact that the uh, the local resident who calls for help. She actually takes 10 minutes to call for help because she's too busy filming the disaster on a camcorder. And final question, does the story end on a positive note or a negative note? So watch out for those things. I'm, I wonder what you're going to think of this. Uh, now that I've told you all those things, let's listen to, um, what is it? Chopper of Doom from It's Your Blood on the day to day to our main visual splash real life tales of danger and rescue which thanks to this little child it's a camcorder we can actually show you each week on it's your blood every week on it's your blood we feature an actual bad accident and show how you can avoid a similar fate this week chopper of doom Helicopters, machines with blades for cutting air, air that's soft and easy to slice, like human beings. If a helicopter hits the ground at 100 miles an hour, it can be rebuilt. But for a man made of crushable bone and ligaments that tear, it's not quite so easy. In recreating the horrific events of the 12th of December 1992, we persuaded the original victims to face that ordeal again. We also use amateur video footage of the nightmare. All bodily fluids shown are the ones which actually emerged at the time. For this reason and many others, you may find the following sequence produces a very powerful sensation in your brain and body. Farmer Chester Johnson uses a chopper for crop surveillance and he flies it himself. It's ten o'clock on the birthday of his sheepdog, Lindsay, and Chester has planned him a treat. It was a ride in the helicopter. 
I knew he'd like it, so I decided to video him for him as a memento. What he didn't know was that he and Lindsay were about to make a flight neither of them would ever forget, even if their brains were erased with mind rubbers. At first, everything was normal. They were up and enjoying the ride. It was smooth and exhilarating, like an aerial motorbike. But then Chester decided to look at his watch, a watch we later found to have a dangerous design. The aircraft was now perilously out of control, and to make matters worse, it was heading straight towards a field of children looking for worms. By sheer luck, a member of the public, Mrs. Maureen Tucker, had noticed the helicopter and started shooting these valuable pictures with her own camera. After ten minutes, she called for help. Hello, control tower. Oh no, it's one of our helicopters out of control. I wonder who that can be. It could be Chester Johnson, and that's got a dog on board. We better call a shepherd then. The steel vulture of Beelzebub was now just seconds away from the children's soft heads. By sheer brilliance, the shepherd dog team also managed to avoid an old woman up a stick in a nearby field. While the heroes celebrated, the shepherd's unattended flock caused a pile-up on the M5 in which 430 people were injured. Mercifully, the ordeal forged such firm bonds between the victims that it led in many cases to marriage. If this happened to you, would you know what to do? Your chances would be improved considerably if you made sure someone on the ground had one of these. It's a pocket shepherd. It costs just 59 pounds. A small price to pay for the gift of a functioning body that works properly. News Jiffy. Okay, so that was uh, Chopper of Doom. A chopper, by the way, is uh, just another word for a helicopter. Okay, so tell you what, let's go through that again, like we did last time. And I'm going to break it down bit by bit so that you understand every single word here. Uh, How was that for you? Did you understand that? I don't, I've not, again, I've no idea what you're thinking. For me, this is very funny. Um, I don't know what it's like for you. Maybe you're finding it funny too. You probably find it less funny than I do, to be fair, for whatever reason. But anyway, um, there's a lot to be gained from this, lots of English. So let's carry on. Here we go. Week. Chopper of Doom. Helicopters, machines with blades for cutting air. Helicopters, machines with blades for cutting air. So, obviously, helicopters have rotor blades on the top, the bits that spin round. Machines with blades for cutting air, air that's soft and easy to slice, like human beings. Air that's soft and easy to slice, like human beings. If a helicopter hits the ground at 100 miles an hour, it can be rebuilt. But for a man made of crushable bone and ligaments that tear, it's not quite so easy. If a helicopter hits the ground at 100 miles an hour, it can be rebuilt. But for a, what is it, for a man made of um, crushable bone and ligaments that tear, it's not quite so simple. I think that's what he said. Crushable bone. So your bones can can be crushed. Ligaments, these are things that attach uh, muscles to bones. They're kind of like the strings that attach, yeah, muscles to bones. Ligaments that tear, that's what happens. I mean, you tear ligaments if you have an accident. For example, if you're playing sport and you stretch a bit too much with your leg, you might oh, tear a ligament in your knee or in your leg somewhere. So for a man made of crushable bone and ligaments that tear, it's not quite so simple. And then he says, in recreating the events, we, we persuaded the original victims to face their ordeal again. So it's almost like the TV producers actually... Uh, against their will, against the will of the the people involved, f- made them retell the story, and it might have even been um, a sort of a cruel thing to do, 
maybe these people didn't want to tell their story again, but the producers of the show forced them to do it, to relive their ordeal again, to face their ordeal again. In recreating the horrific events of the 12th of December 1992, we persuaded the original victims to face that ordeal again. We also use amateur video footage of the nightmare. All bodily fluids shown are the ones which actually emerged at the time. <laughs> all, bod- all bodily fluids, so we, we know what they are. All bodily fluids shown are the ones that actually emerged at the time. The kind of formal language as well uh, makes it funny. For this reason and many others, you may find the following sequence produces a very powerful sensation in your brain and body. Farmer Chester Johnson uses a chopper for crop surveillance and he flies it himself. Farmer Chester Johnson uses a chopper for crop surveillance. Crops are all of the uh, plants and things that you grow on a farm. So we grow, you know, things like wheat and corn, maize and stuff like that. Just basic, you know, plants uh, which provide us with food and other things. Uh, Crops, we call them. So he uses his chopper for crop surveillance. Surveillance meaning uh, watching things, um, keeping an eye on things, observing things. So he uses his chopper for crop surveillance. It's 10 o'clock on the birthday of his sheepdog, Lindsay, and Chester has planned him a treat. Chester has planned his sheepdog, Lindsay, a treat for his birthday. A treat, T-R-E-A-T. This is something that you do for someone that you you like as a sort of reward for probably good behaviour, or maybe if it's a special day, like if it's, you know, if it's your birthday, you might get a treat from uh, someone that you love. They might take you out for a for dinner they might buy you something nice that's a treat similarly if you do something good so if you've been a good boy then you might deserve a treat and with a dog if you're training a dog if if you say sit and the dog sits you would give the dog a little treat so like a little snack to eat or something it was a ride in the helicopter i knew he'd like it so i decided to video it for him as a memento it was a ride in the helicopter i knew he'd like it so i decided to video it for him as a memento. A memento is something that helps you remember something else. A bit like a souvenir, basically. Uh, Okay. What he didn't know was that he and Lindsay were about to make a flight neither of them would ever forget, even if their brains were erased with mind rubbers. Okay. They were about to make a flight that neither would forget, even if their brains were erased with mind rubbers. I mean, rubbers, we know, are things that you use to correct work that you've done on paper with a pencil, right? You just rub it out. But, you know, obviously, even if their brains were erased with mind rubbers, doesn't make any sense. Um, And it sounds ridiculous, but I like it. At first, everything was normal. They were up and enjoying the ride. It was smooth and exhilarating, like an aerial motorbike. So there's Lindsay's voice over the dog. (laughs) But then Chester decided to look at his watch. A watch we later found to have a dangerous design. Okay, so that's what caused... Um, uh, what's his name? The shepherd. Uh, no, the, the farmer. That's what caused the farmer to pass out. It's his watch. We later learned that the watch had a dangerous design. Whatever that means. So he looked at the watch. The watch had a dangerous design. And somehow the design made him pass out. Okay. A late, uh, uh, he looked at his watch, a watch we later discovered had a dangerous design. The aircraft was now perilously out of control. and The aircraft was perilous, perilously out of control. If something is perilous, it's full of danger, full of risk, full of peril. Danger, risk, hazard, uh, peril, okay? Perilous, it's just like dangerous, risky basically okay so uh, the de- helicopter was perilously out of control to make matters worse it was heading straight towards a field of children looking for worms it was heading straight towards a field full of children heading is a, a, a nice verb to head somewhere meaning to go in a certain direction when you get to the pub you'd say come on let's head for the bar where you order your drinks in this case the helicopter was heading for a field full of children looking for worms sheer luck a member of the public mrs maureen tucker had noticed the helicopter and started shooting these valuable pictures with her own camera (laughs) started shooting these valuable pictures with her own camera 
Did you notice the pronunciation? Remember before we had very, you know, very poor, and we had Americans and America, and now we've got, she started shooting these valuable pictures with her own camera. Um, just that sort of very um, characteristic speech pattern that you get with someone like Michael Burke, but also it's just something you get from old school uh, English TV presenters and news readers. After 10 minutes, she called for help. So she calls, uh, I guess, like, uh, who would it be? Who are the people who... Air traffic control. I guess she gets through to air, air traffic controllers. And in the video, the air traffic control staff are played by genuine air traffic control staff. So they're not actors. They're the real people playing themselves, which is something that they used to do on 999. They would use the ambulance workers to actually play themselves. And so naturally their acting is absolutely terrible. So you're going to hear some really awful acting (laughs) and the video as well. They're very wooden um, and terrible actors. So you hear some slightly awful acting. It's only brief uh, from the air traffic controllers. Hello, Control Tower. Oh, no, it's one of our helicopters out of control. Oh, oh no, it's one of our helicopters out of control. <laughs> I don't know, it doesn't sound that bothered. After ten minutes, she called for help. Hello, Control Tower. Oh, no, it's one of our helicopters out of control. I wonder who that can be. I wonder who that can be, said the other guy, not sounding very interested either. It could be Chester Johnson. And that's got a dog on board. We better call a shepherd then. The steam vulture of Beelzebub was now just seconds away from the children's soft heads. So at this point, they've they've called a shepherd. The shepherd is arriving at the air control tower, and he starts communicating with the dog through the CB radio, whistling. And the dog is biting the stick and controlling the helicopter in order to make sure it doesn't crash into the children's. Soft heads. By sheer brilliance, the shepherd dog team also managed to avoid an old woman up a stick in a nearby field. Okay, that's just really, really weird, uh, which I'm sure some of you will just say, oh, this is British comedy. Uh, But for some reason, at the end, you, you also have, by sheer brilliance, the shepherd dog team also managed to avoid an old woman up a stick in a nearby field. For some reason, there's a woman sitting in a chair... Uh, on the top of a big stick in the ground. So there's a big, big, tall stick with a woman sitting on the top of it. And by sheer brilliance, the shepherd dog team also managed to avoid her. Don't ask me why there's a woman sitting on the top of a stick in a field. I've no idea. It's very strange. It's just one of those weird, surreal things, okay? But does the story end on a positive or negative note? Here we go. While the heroes celebrated, the shepherd's unattended flock caused a pile-up on the M5 in which... So, first of all, it seems positive because they're, you know, they're celebrating. Uh, while the guys, well, whoever it is, uh, while the team celebrate, um, the shepherd's unattended flock caused a pile-up on the M4. A pile-up is a big crash involving lots of cars. So if you have a big um, motorway or highway or something and, you know, imagine a flock of sheep run across the road, lots of cars would crash and other cars would crash into them. It would cause a big pile-up. So this is actually very bad, like a very bad thing happened because the shepherd was involved in helping the helicopter to to land. Um, His flock of sheep was left unattended and they ran across the road and caused a massive pile-up. So there's actually a terribly tragic ending here involving the shepherd's sheep causing a big car crash. The shepherd dog team also managed to avoid an old woman up a stick in a nearby field. While the heroes celebrated, the shepherd's unattended flock caused a pile-up on the M5 in which 430 people were injured. Mercifully, the ordeal forged such firm bonds between the victims that it led in many cases to marriage. Okay, so in fact, weirdly at the end, it goes positive again. So the the shepherd uh, the shepherd's unattended flock caused a pile up on the M5, uh, causing lots of injuries, and, and then it was like uh, it caused such firm bonds between people. So the accident brought people together in such a way that it led, in many cases, to marriage. 
So in a weird way, it ends up positive at the end that the accident brought people, the victims kind of like were brought together by it and it led in many cases to marriage, which I guess is a positive end to the story. So kind of just weird twists and turns at the end. The flock caused a pileup on the M5 in which 430 people were injured. Mercifully, the ordeal forged such firm bonds between the victims that it led in many cases to marriage. If this happened to you, would you know what to do? Exactly the sort of thing they'd say in the original show. Your chances would be improved considerably if you made sure someone on the ground had one of these. So he's actually got this thing called a pocket shepherd, which is like a <laughs> some kind of mechanical uh, device that basically makes the noises of a shepherd. I don't know if this is a real thing. I think it's just a kind of stupid little toy. But he's saying, if this happened to you, would you want, know what to do? Your chances would be improved dramatically if someone on the ground had one of these. It's a pocket shepherd. It's a pocket shepherd. It costs just £59, a small price to pay for the gift of a functioning body that works properly. <laughs> uh, just the tone of it. It's a pocket shepherd. It costs just £59, a small price to pay for a functioning body that works perfectly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to let me know what you think of this. Does this seem like just totally ridiculous and unfunny nonsense? Or is this like really on the nose, really good, on point, very funny content? I would go for the second option. But of course, comedy is subjective. And maybe me explaining it all like this, as I've said before, uh, is not helping. Maybe it's just removing all the comedy from it. I don't know. I don't know. But you know, I, I need to do these things. I have to share this show with you because I think it's so brilliant. And it would be wonderful if you also found it to be entertaining too. But anyway, you're learning English from doing this, right? I think so. Okay, let's move on to the second clip. This is from episode six of the day to day. I've called it redundancy. And in this one, we're going to hear again from Peter O'Hanrahan, the economics correspondent. So Peter O'Hanrahan is back. This time, the story is that General Motors in Detroit have laid off some workers at their factory. I just want to deal with a bit of language here. Um, so we've got the word factory and also the word plant. So we know that a plant is something that grows out of the ground, like, um, you know, like a, um, a flower or something is a plant or, or whatever it is, crops and stuff, they're plants. Excuse me. So uh, a plant is a thing that grows out of the ground, but also a plant is another word for a factory. So you might have a, a, um, a plant producing cars in Detroit and then we've got the expression to lay someone off or to make someone redundant. They both mean the same thing. So in this case, General Motors in Detroit have laid off some workers at their factory. That means they've made the workers redundant. So it doesn't mean that the workers are fired, but it does mean that the workers no longer have work. They don't have a job anymore. Uh, and it, But it's not because those workers did anything wrong. It's just because the company needs to save money. So they cut jobs to save money. So that's to lay someone off, to make someone redundant. So um, General Motors have laid off some workers at their factory, at their plant. Okay, so the question is, how many workers have been laid off? Well, Peter O'Hanrahan Hanrahan has the story live in Detroit. The thing is, of course, he's got the wrong number. He says it's 35,000 workers. Chris Morris doesn't believe him and he presses him on this, forcing him to embarrass himself by showing his notes that he'd written and the notes have, and we see the notes on camera, they have various like things written down, but also lots of doodles. Doodles are things that you draw while you're maybe just thinking about something else. Like if you're on the telephone, you might doodle pictures or if you are attending some kind of conference and you're not really listening, you might be doodling pictures. Uh, Peter's notes have a big doodle of a spider in a spider's web in the corner of the page. Um, and he doesn't have the right numbers. And Chris Morris tells Peter off like he's a naughty schoolboy. He tells him off uh, like he's a naughty schoolboy. So listen out for Peter's um, initial conviction at the moment that this is mass redundancy on an unprecedented scale. So he's very sure about this. And then listen out for how Chris shows his scepticism over Peter's number, just like we had in the last episode where Chris was sceptical about whether Peter had actually spoken to the German minister. Listen out for how Peter quickly admits that he's wrong 
when Chris asks to see his notes. So quickly goes, no, you're right. No, it's you're right. Uh, you're right. It's it's twenty five hundred. Uh, he quickly admits that because he doesn't want to show Chris Morris his notes. And then Chris Morris at the end says, you're lying in a news grave. A grave is where you put a, a body, when it's died, you bury a body in a grave in the ground. And in this case, you're lying in a news grave. What does it, stay, what does it say on the gravestone? So what, what's written on the gravestone for Peter's grave that he's lying in, his news grave? You can answer that question. Okay, so let's listen to... Peter O'Hanrahan talking about uh, mass redundancy on an unprecedented scale at the Detroit plant of General Motors. The American car company General Motors have today announced a cut in their workforce at their plant in Detroit. Our economics correspondent Peter O'Hanrahan is there at the moment. Peter, what's going on? Chris, it's a mass redundancy measure. It's the biggest layoff in American industrial history. 35,000 jobs in one fell swoop. Gone. 35,000? Yes. Peter, there's only 25,000 people at the plant. That's right, Chris. Mass redundancy on an unprecedented scale. Well, would you mind telling me how the plant can function on minus 10,000 workers? I don't know, Chris. You tell me. I'll tell you what, Peter. You mean 3,500 workers have been sacked? No. 35,000. It's all here. Let me see what you've got down there. It's 3,500, you're Peter, right. I, I, want to s- I want to see it. I don't want to hear anything more out of your mouth. I don't believe it. Now, show me your notes. No. Yes. It, it's 3,500. Show me. I don't believe what you're saying. I just want to see the numbers. Now, hold them up. Hold them up and keep them up. And rotate them 180 degrees in my favour. Do it. Peter, what's that? I don't have a monitor, Chris. I can't see what you're doing. You know what I'm talking about. It's just above your right eye. Yes. A cobweb. And how's a cobweb going to dig you out of your numerical mess? I don't know. Peter, you're lying in a news grave. Do you know what's written on your headstone? News. Peter, thank you. Peter O'Hanrahan, live in Detroit. Okay, short one. Let's go through it again so that we can break it down. All right, here we go. Here we go. Just rewinding the video here on my phone. Still using my phone because my computer's buggered, I think is the technical term for it. In Detroit. Our economics correspondent, Peter O'Hanrahan, is there at the moment. Peter, what's going on? Chris, it's a mass redundancy measure. It's the biggest layoff in American industrial history. The biggest layoff in American industrial history. So we had to lay someone off or to be laid off. Here's the noun version. It's a layoff, okay? Um, Redundancy and to make someone redundant. 35,000 jobs in one fell swoop. Gone. In one fell swoop. One fell swoop. Fell is like kind of evil, uh, dark. uh, So in one fell swoop. Hmm... It means in one go, in one single go. But I'm trying to think of where the expression comes from. A swoop is like something that that, that an eagle would do. An eagle would swoop down to pick up like a rabbit or something from the ground in one fell swoop. Basically, in one fell swoop means in one go. And it's usually when something bad happens, all in one go. In this case, 35,000 redundancies in one fell swoop. 35,000? Yes, Peter, there's only 25,000 people at the plant. That's right, Chris. Mass redundancy on an unprecedented scale. Unprecedented, meaning it's never happened before. Well, would you mind telling me how the plant can function on minus 10,000 workers? I don't know, Chris. You tell me. I'll tell you what, Peter. You mean 3,500 workers have been sacked. Okay, so 35,000, obviously, is 35,000. 3,500 is actually 3,500. It's just another another way of saying it. So 3,500 would be 3,500, also known as 3,500 or 3,500. So in fact, the number is 3,500, just, uh, what, 10% of what he's saying? Is it 10% or 1%? You tell tell me. No, 35,000, it's all here. I love the way that he, he kind of he shows his notes for a second. It's all here. And as soon as Chris Morris asks to see the notes, Peter 
immediately admits, no, uh, sorry, no, it, it's 3,500 because he doesn't want Chris to see the stupid drawings he's been doing. Let me see what you've got down there. It's 3,500, you're Peter, right. I, I, want to s- I want to see it. I don't want to hear anything more out of your mouth. I don't believe it. Now, show me your notes. No. Yes. It's 3,500. Show me. I don't believe what you're saying. I just want to see the numbers. Now, hold them up. Hold them up and keep them up. And rotate them 180 degrees in my favour. Rotate them 180 degrees in my favour basically means turn them around or show them to me. Because he's got the notes up, but the, we can only see the back, so we can't see anything that's written. So rotate them 180 degrees in my favour means, you know, show them to me or turn them around so I can see them. Do it. Peter, what's that? I don't have a monitor, Chris. I can't see what you're doing. You know what I'm talking about. It's just above your right eye. Yes. A cobweb. (laughs) A cobweb. He's still in that kind of news voice. A cobweb. So this is what a spider makes, right? A spider makes a cobweb um, to catch flies. So he's, he's drawn a cobweb in the corner. What's that in the corner? A cobweb. And how's a cobweb going to dig you out of your numerical mess i don't know peter you're lying in a news grave do you know what's written on your headstone news peter thank you peter hanrahan live in detroit peter you're lying in a news grave do you know what's written on the headstone so the grave is where the body is buried the headstone is uh the piece of stone that sticks up And it's often got a message or names and things written on it, okay? Peter, you're lying in a news grave. Do you know what's written on your headstone? News? Peter, Peter Hanrahan, thank you. All right, now let's move on to the um, third and I think final clip that we're going to deal with uh, here in this double episode. And this one is called, um, this is a clip from The Pool. The Pool was like a little kind of uh, parody documentary uh, about a swimming pool. So this is from a spoof. A spoof is another word for parody. This is from a spoof fly-on-the-wall documentary, the sort of documentary where the camera crew follows people around their daily lives. So this is from a spoof fly-on-the-wall documentary about a municipal swimming pool in London and the people that work there. Now, you know that kind of thing. A camera crew follow people around their working life and reveal little human dramas that go on and tell the story of people in their ordinary lives in their own words. This kind of documentary was very, very popular in the 90s, very cheap to make. Just basically send a camera crew to spend like four weeks in a company or whatever, just filming people and uh, capturing little human dramas and the stories of people's everyday lives. They call those fly-on-the-wall documentaries. In this one, we're at a swimming pool and we're following some of the staff there. We see footage of the staff interacting, dealing with problems and so on. We see what it's really like to work at a swimming pool. Now, there used to be a lot of shows like this on TV, as I said, and they spawned parodies like The Office, like the Ricky Gervais TV show The Office is a parody of this kind of documentary. The bit that I want to look at here is Steve Coogan as the pool's security guard. So in this clip, he's playing a much older man, and it's pure Peter Cook. Peter Cook is a comedian who probably did his most notable work during the 60s and 70s. And he was just known for playing certain types of character. I did an episode about Peter Cook and Dudley Moore years ago. It's in the archive. So anyway, this this reminds me a lot of a performance. This performance reminds me of the sort of thing that Peter Cook used to do. It's a great little comedy character that we've never seen again outside of this clip. So he's the security guard at the pool. And he works there during the night, for example. And he describes his work, including several incidents uh, that have occurred during his long career as the pool security guard. Like when a pigeon got into the pool once. I mean, that's it. It seems that his working life is extremely boring and mundane. You know, he just talks about nothing really happens. There was an incident once when a pigeon managed to get in and there was a lot of commotion uh, as the pigeon was flying around in the roof and uh, you know, I called the services and they, they removed it in the morning. So you know, his life is bas- his working life is very boring and mundane. But then we learn that one year, some time ago, a person was actually killed at the pool at night when people broke in and started playing around in the pool. Someone was actually killed. 
And there's a question of whether the security guard is somehow responsible for this. And I love the way he responds to the suggestion that he's liable for the person's death. So I'd like to listen out for Steve Coogan's tone of voice, his accent and other little touches that make this an authentic feeling character. Listen out for the way that the way Steve Coogan's story about the pigeon has a very boring ending. Listen out for what he did one night when he found a woman's swimsuit. So what did he do one night when he found a woman's swimsuit down by the pool? And also what is his response to the allegation that he was responsible for the death at the pool once? Okay, so let's just queue up the video and you can listen to Steve Coogan as the pool security guard. And here we go. I'm a pool supervisor, the night supervisor. I basically watch the monitors at night, see if anything occurs. Um, there was one incident, I remember it quite clearly. I was filling in a puzzle and I, I heard the noise. It was a commotion up in the rafters. And uh, somehow, we never know even to this day, a pigeon had got in, was flapping around in the rafters. We called the bird specialists, they, they removed it in the morning. I'm never tempted to use the pool myself at night. Um, although some time ago I used to go down and take showers. Um, and uh, on one occasion I went down and to the pool and uh, found a woman's swimming costume which I put on and uh, paraded around uh, singing, uh, singing a song, Joan Bias protest song. This pool's been open nearly 40 years. And in all that time, I only slipped up once, to my mind. I was engaged in a particularly tricky uh, word puzzle, um, and 40 people had broken in, were in the pool, playing, playing around, sort of ducking, bombing, doing all manner of uh, prohibited activities. And uh, eventually someone was killed. But given that your sole responsibility is to maintain the security of the pool, isn't that an indictment against yourself? Well, I, I would say this. I've been working here for 18 years. In 1975, no one died. In 1976, no one died. In 1977, no one died. In 1978, no one died. In 1979, no one died. In 1980, someone died. In 1981, no one died. In 1982, there was the incident with a, a pigeon. In 1983, no one died. In 1984, no one died. In 1985, no one died. In 1986, I mean, I could go on. No. Right. Ultra News. Okay, that was Steve Coogan as the, what is it, the superintendent, the security man, uh, the night superintendent. Okay, so let's break it down for language. I'm a pool supervisor, the night supervisor. I supervisor, okay. Basically watch the monitors at night, see if anything occurs. Um, there was one incident, I remember it quite clearly, I was filling in a puzzle... I was filling in a puzzle. So he spends his time filling in puzzles, you know, puzzles, things like crosswords. You fill them in, meaning you write all the, the letters in the right spaces. So I was spending my time uh, filling in a, a puzzle, a word puzzle. And I, I heard the noise. It was a commotion up in the rafters. There was a, a, a commotion up in the rafters. Now, that's the sort of language that an older person might use, a commotion. So if you can imagine a pigeon has, has managed to get inside a swimming pool and it's at the top of the ceiling, the rafters, these are the parts of the ceiling. So it's it probably like either pieces of wood that go across the top of the ceiling or in this case, pieces of metal uh, right at the top part of the structure of the ceiling. There was a commotion up in the rafters. A commotion is basically a lot of noise, a lot of confusion. 
So you can imagine a pigeon flapping around at the top of the swimming pool, up in the ceiling, up in the rafters. So he said that there was a lot of noise, a lot of commotion up in the rafters. And uh, somehow, we never know even to this day, a pigeon had got in, was flapping around in the rafters. A pigeon had got in and was flapping around in the, the rafters. We call the bird specialists. They, they removed it in the morning. <laughs> I mean, the fact that the story goes nowhere makes me laugh a lot. We called the bird specialist. They came and removed it in the morning. Oh, OK. That's the end of the story. All right, let's move on to the next bit. I'm never tempted to use the pool myself. I'm never tempted to use the pool myself. Tempted, that's a nice word. If you're tempted to do something, it means that something kind of seems appealing to you. Um, it means you feel like doing something. Um, for example, if you see a lovely chocolate cake in the window, you're like, ooh, that looks nice. I'd like to eat it. So if you're tempted to do something, it means that you would like to do it. But something kind of makes you want to do it. Something tempts you. So it's tempting. Okay. So he said, I've, I've never been tempted to use the pool myself, meaning I've never wanted to use it myself. Night. Um, although some time ago, I used to go down and take showers. Sometime I used to go down and take showers. It's a bit weird. Um, and uh, on one occasion, I went down and to the pool and uh, found a woman's swimming costume, which I put on and uh, paraded around. So one time I went down and found a women's swimming costume, which I put on. So he started to wear the, the costume. He said, I, I found a women's swimming costume, which I put on and paraded around. If you parade around, it means you sort of... If you can imagine walking around... In order to show off, to show everyone, you might even be doing some sort of dancing. Like at a parade at a, um, at a festival or a carnival, you have people in outfits parading along the, uh, the, you know, through the carnival in their fancy dress. In this case, he put on this women's swimsuit and started parading around singing a song, a protest song. A protest song would have been an old song from the folk days where, you know, songs of protest against... Um, uh, exploitation or against the government. In this case, he found the women's swimming costume, put it on and started parading around singing a song, a protest song, Joan Baez. And uh, singing, uh, singing a song, Joan Baez, protest song. This is... <laughs> OK, uh, we skip past some other little scenes. Here we go. This pool's been open nearly 40 years. There's the old present perfect. This pool's been open... This pool has been open. This pool's been open nearly how many years? I can't remember, but it doesn't matter. And in all that time, I only slipped up once. In all that time, I only slipped up once. If you slip up, it means you make a mistake. So in all that time, I only slipped up once. To my mind, I was engaged in a particularly tricky uh, word puzzle um, and 40 people broken in we're in the pool so he was doing a he was engaged in a particularly difficult word puzzle and 40 people had broken in and were in the pool and he goes on to say they were doing all manner of prohibited activities so we know that at the pool there are certain things that are prohibited so that means things like ducking bombing ducking means going under the water or putting pushing other people under the water uh, bombing means um, jumping into the water and rolling yourself up into a ball so you make a big splash so 40 people had broken into the pool um, and were uh, in the pool doing all manner of prohibited activities which is definitely something he's responsible for he's responsible for not allowing this kind of thing to happen and in fact he was just doing a word puzzle at the time playing, playing around sort of ducking bombing doing all manner of uh, prohibited activities and uh eventually someone was killed oh dear so it had a tragic ending but given that your sole responsibility is to maintain the security of the pool isn't that an indictment against yourself well, given that your sole responsibility s-o-l-e meaning your only responsibility given that your sole responsibility is to maintain security at the pool isn't this an indictment of you? Isn't this an indictment of yourself? An indictment um, is basically sort of an accusation of a serious thing, an, a formal accu accusation of a, of a crime 
or of of any other sort of bad thing. So this is an an indictment of of him. Well, I, I would say this. Now, I just love the way, just obviously comedy, um, and one of the rules of comedy is sort of repetition. But this is something that Steve Coogan has done lots of times before in different situations, different performances and stuff. Repeating something again and again, and you repeat it, until it and, and it gets funny as you repeat it and then it stops being funny and then it becomes funny again as you continue repeating it so this whole kind of no one died thing is a sort of repetition the comedy of repetition i've been working here for 18 years in 1975 no one died in 1976 no one died in 1977 no one died in 1978 no one died in 1979 no one died. In 1980, someone died. In 1981, no one died. In 1982, there was the incident with a pigeon. In 1983, no one died. In 1984, no one died. In 1985, no one died. In 1986, I mean, I could go on. No. <laughs> um... All right. That's it then, ladies and gentlemen. That was my presentation of the day to day for your listening enjoyment and um, as a suggestion of something that you could watch more of. All of those episodes are on um, YouTube. You just search for the day to day. But also the DVD box set is really good and it has uh, various bonus extras on it. And in fact, I remember... When I got the DVD box set for the first time, I remember watching one of those extras with my brother. And there was one extra, which was like a mini don- documentary about news broadcasting and how the day-to-day uses the style of news for comic effect. So we were watching this little mini documentary. And after a couple of minutes, we were surprised to see none other than our dad on screen. That's it, Rick Thompson. He'd been filmed for the documentary and he was there uh, in the BBC newsroom, talking about news in this uh, DVD extra from the day to day. So naturally, we we're both delighted. Dad had forgotten that he'd, he'd ever done it, but there it is. My dad is in the DVD extras for the DVD uh, for the day to day box set. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I said at the beginning of this episode, please do write your comments in the comments section. I would love to know what you think of these episodes about the day-to-day and how does it strike you, mate? I, I mean, I, I really, really hope that you get it because when I do these things and people write to me, I didn't find it funny, or it's not that funny. Obviously, I'm very disappointed because personally, I find it very funny. I mean, I've told you before about my experiences as a teacher in the classroom, showing people bits of comedy and getting like no response and thinking to myself, oh God, they hated it. Hopefully, that's not the case here. Um, But like I said before, in any case, I think there's been lots of English to, to pick up from this. Check out the page for the episode on the website. You'll find various notes and also videos embedded. Um, a note for premium subscribers. I uh, just uploaded um, uh, premium series number 13, which covered language uh, that came up in episode 592, I think, of Luke's English podcast. There's more premium content coming. I've been working on it, so I'll be doing more premium stuff. If you want to sign up for Luke's English podcast premium and gain access to the growing library of basically like English lessons, um, from me, which include explaining and demonstrating and giving lots and lots of examples of um, really nice, useful, natural language, vocab and grammar. I, I repeat things again and again. I repeat them over and over again so that you really get them, give you lots of examples, give you my tips and advice and make little uh, points about certain words that may be difficult to, to pick up. And then, of course, there are pronunciation drills uh, which you can listen to and repeat. Your you, The idea is to repeat the, the sentences after me. In the last premium episode, I did a special focus on uh, schwa sounds, which affects, well, it's, it's all part of sentence stress about which words are emphasized and weak forms of auxiliary verbs and prepositions and things like that. So if you want to get all of that in-depth um, stuff about language, which includes lots of listen and repeat stuff, then you can get it from Luke's English Podcast Premium. Just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium to get started and all the information you need is there. Um, I look forward to reading your comments. 
But for now, it's just time for me to say thank you and goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.